gathered again the three holiest days of our year, our journey now from the upper room we'll celebrate tonight to cross the cross line to the tomb and to the joy of Easter Sunday. I encourage you to take this time seriously, set aside some time to think about it and to live into it deeply and fully as we prepare for Sunday as well. A couple of just other real quick announcements. One is, of course, tomorrow we'll have services at noon at 7 p.m. It's the same service, but at both times. And then Sunday at 8 and 10 a.m., we'll have brass and choir at both services. So plan on making one of those two services and bring a friend if you can as well. And also, just on a lighter note, know that you're on camera when you leave the church or when you come into the church now. The security system, the new security system was installed yesterday. So you're officially on the cloud when you come in the hallway by the, by the office or when you're coming downstairs. So just so you know, you'll be hearing more about measures we're taking to make sure we ensure safety for everyone. Thank you.
Almighty God, this dear Son of the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood. Mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, and who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in, a, in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly, assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not any, eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall, you shall celebrate it, as a festival to the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant, I am your servant, and the child of your handmaid, you have of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. 
The second reading comes from the first chapter of Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. The word of the Lord.
Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who betrayed him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, but not all. For he knew who was betrayed him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he had put on his robe, and he returned to the table and said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? you? You call me Master and Teacher and Lord, and you are right, and that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and Teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, the servants are not greater than the master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed with them if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him in Christ. Little children, and with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is the night when we gather as the family of God around the table where Jesus feeds us with his very self, his body and blood. It is the night we see Jesus humble himself to wash the dirty, sweaty feet of his disciples. It is the night we hear and remember his journey to Gethsemane. It's yet his desperate prayer that if God's will, if it be God's will that the cup he was to drink might pass, so be it. But ultimately, it's the night in which he submits himself to the Father's will and lives into his full identity as Messiah, Savior, life, and hope of the world. It is a night that echoes the Passover as the disciples meet as good observant Jews to faithfully remember the exodus of God's people from slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea and, and the journey through the wilderness to a promised land. It is a night in which identity is given, confirmed, and celebrated. And all of this is rooted in the words Jesus says as he offers him very self to his disciples. Do this in remembrance of me. Now I don't remember a lot of my Greek study from seminary 40 years ago. But I do remember this word. What we translate as remembrance or do this in remembrance of me. 
is anamnesis in Greek. It is a word that means so much more than to just recall the past or to even to revere or celebrate the past. It means so, how, so as to, so to remember the past event that we live into it and claim as real the events of the past here and now so they become the very present reality of our life. It is tonight that Jesus stands among us and offers himself, his body and his blood. It is this kind of remembrance that provides the stuff that defines who and what we are. And as I thought about this and how this is the reality of family rituals and traditions as well, outside of the family of God. On a lighter note, you may know the Hank Williams song in which he talks, sings of family traditions. Some of them not so healthy, saying, why do you blow smoke? Why do you stay all night and par- out all night and party, Hank? He says, if I'm doing that, I'm just following the family tradition. I'm being who I was raised and rooted in to, to be, and I'm following the past in which I was rooted. And hopefully not all of our family traditions are quite the same, but they are real. For example, I remember clearly that when we arrived at my maternal grandparents' house, the first thing we had to do was go and say hello to our grandfather, who was probably seated in the large throne-like chair, it seemed to me as a young child, in the sunroom. He was a large man with a stern personality, and we were lucky if we got so much as it's good to see you from him. But we had to go and say hello. Only then could we go and receive a hug from our grandmother or go to the kitchen to get a treat from Miss Gert, who always helped when the family gathered for meals. And then, after the meal, we knew what would happen. All the children would gather and be told stories by my eight grand, uh, great aunt Columbia. And there were stories of our family history and other stories. It's in these kind of family gatherings that I learned that Hayes, Kentucky was named for my great-great-great-grandfather when he donated land for what would become the rail depot. Or I learned about Absalom Show, who had been part of the Great Awakening in Kentucky in the 1830s and had been one of the founders of the first Campbellite church in that area, the precursor to our friends across the street at First Christian Church. There were also ghost stories, and there were stories about farm life. There were stories about the special quilt that my sister owns today, which was made of fibers grown on the farm, spun by my great-great-great-grandmother, woven, sewn into my great-great-grandfather's work shirts, and then used as a patchwork quilt when he began to wear them out. Stories about what it meant to be people of the earth. And as I grew older, I even heard some less edifying stories, if you will, such as the ones about my great-grandfather's mother, who was seemingly a less than perfect person and mother, and rather difficult, to say the least, and who decided early on that she was tired and quit taking care of her many children and left it to her oldest daughter. Not so good things, as long with the good ones. And there were the family rituals in addition to that. We knew exactly what would be served at the meal. For Easter, we had ham, not the traditional country ham, but a store-bought one. There would be green beans, corn on the cob, macaroni and cheese, dressed eggs, and homemade biscuits. And for dessert, I absolutely knew there would be angel food cake and boiled custard. Now, I don't even like angel food cake and boiled custard. But I ate it at my grandmother's on Easter or at other special occasions. And there were rituals about just about everything, birthdays, weddings, funerals, and they all involve food and storytelling, and they're all about giving us an identity as who we were, understanding who we were. And even though I was less stru- it was less structured on my father's side, I realized the stories were just as real about how my grandfather and my father had to learn to live together as a single man and a young boy after my grandmother began to suffer from mental illness. We never had rice to eat at my house because my father remembered too many nights when all they had to eat was overcooked rice. Because, as with many men of his generation, my grandfather never expected to have to cook for himself or anyone else. There were positive stories and less than positive stories. 
and traditions, but they shaped us and gave us identity. And one of the traditions that shaped me was going fishing with my grandfather and learning to sit in silence and wait. As I grew older, the stories changed and sometimes even had to decide if the identity they seemed to carry was one I wanted to claim as my own or one that I did not want to claim. Such as, would I claim the identity as the descendant of my father's great-grandparents who were among the founders of Breakaway Methodist Church in Webster County, Kentucky, when it was founded in opposition to slavery? Or would I accept the highly racist and prejudiced culture that pervaded the family I grew up in a few generations later? Identities have positives, have negatives, and they require us to make some choices and decisions. And that's the case for all of us. I was speaking earlier with a friend who I did not know until today, comes from a family that comes from the Roma Gypsy culture. We were talking about some of the differences and some of the ways the rituals in that culture were particularly around celebrating, celebrating mourning and passing of one, the death of one. We we're talking about such things as for their family, Easter was, a, was, was always celebrated, but the big date is April 23rd. Anybody know what April 23rd is? It's St. George's Day. And it, it marked the day when the gypsies could begin traveling. And we talked about the good, the bad, the hard, and the wonderful about the tradition that he grew up in, and how that shapes identity, and how it affects the way we, we respond to the life we live today. And I was thinking about others. I know that at least, I don't know all of your stories, but I guarantee all of us would suggest that for maybe Diane and Jenny, any family traditions and rituals were probably be built around music. You could get that that there was going to be music in any gathering, any event, any, and that was one of the things that shaped and molded your reality, was sharing that. All of us have these family traditions, stories, and rituals that have shaped us and formed us. But tonight we gather to celebrate the rituals and stories that form us as the people of God. So what are these rituals really about? The Holy Eucharist, the foot washing, the Garden of Gethsemane. One, they say that we are a people who are hosted by God, invited to gather around the table of God's abundance. It may not look like the abundant table of my grandmother's house with more food and drink than even our large extended family could possibly consume. Rather, it is simple bread and wine, symbols of the essentials of human life, and physical substance. Simple foods transformed into the very person of God to feed our deepest needs as humans. Food for our spiritual hunger. Theologians have argued for 2,000 years about what it means to say that this is the body and blood of Christ. We can talk about transfiguration, constant, constant termination, you name it, name it. And we could continue that discussion tonight. Or maybe not. But what we can confirm is that even when we do not understand how or why, we know that we are being fed tonight by the very presence and substance of Jesus in this simple meal. He is here among us both as host and as food, offering himself here and now in very self. We hear the traditional story of the Passover, and like the good Jews who met that night in an upper room, we understand that this is the action that God has continued even in our lives. Bringing us out of moments of death and slavery, to whatever that might be, into a new kind of life. Calling us onto a journey to a different place. Promising that that place will be a place of milk and honey. And we hear in that story of the foot washing that we are those who've been served by God. Now, we did foot washing a couple times early on in my tenure here at Grace Church, and to be quite frank, most of us don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable. We don't even like very much the idea of Jesus being the one who kneels and washes the misformed and stinky feet of his disciples. 
Because foot washing is about intimacy. It is about nakedness, if you will. And what we hear tonight is that Jesus loves us enough to even wash those parts of us that are as stinky as our feet. And while that's reassuring, it's hard too. And what is really hard is we hear we are those who call to do the same for one another and for the world. We are called to serve as he did. And that that's our identity. That is who we were formed to be. To be those who, out of our experience of being served by God, having been named worthy of such service, share that experience with the world. We are those who know the depth of divine love that doesn't turn away even in the Garden of Gethsemane. That knows the reality, that we are those who know the reality of betrayal, of denial, of death. We know the depth of divine love. And we know that God has invited us into that kind of love. This is our identity. This is our family story. This is our tradition. As we gather tonight, we once again begin to live into this reality of who we are called to be. It's interesting, that Greek word I talked about early, anamnesis, which is what it means to remember. As you might not be too surprised, it is the root word also of one probably more familiar to us, amnesia. And this, what is at stake tonight is if we do not live into and claim our identity, our story, we will suffer amnesia and lose the knowledge of who we are. This is the night. This is the time Jesus stands among us. This is the time we find out once again who we are. May God give us the grace to accept and live into that identity and to share it with the world. Amen. Let us continuously stand in the firm of our name the words that I see in the truth. We believe in one God.
the prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For Rowan, Archbishop of Canterbury, our presiding Bishop Michael, Mark, our Bishop, Anne, our Bishop, Cojunter elect, Joe, our Rector, Tom and, Ar Tom and Aaron, our Wardens, and all the members of the Vestry, and for the clergy and people of the Diocese of Ohio, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the Church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. We pray for Joe, our president, Mike, our governor, Tim, our mayor, and all other elected officials of our several communities, and for the leaders of the nations of the world. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. From our parish prayer list, we remember Logan Prater, Richard Rom, Sally Rom, Bob Smart, Nancy Smith. Please add your own peti petitions aloud or silently. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. From our parish memorial list, we remember Ray Heberlin, Clifford D. Heaton, Amber Heaton, Carl H. Henkel, Olive B. Henkel, and others we now name aloud or silently. I ask your prayers and thanksgivings aloud or silently. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all eternity for help. You are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty God, Father, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and we pray our hearts and sins in the forgiveness which we need from time to time for the spiritual to have committed by the God of the word and deed against our divine majesty, provoking most justly by our act of indignation against us. We do our Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of His great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto Him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to Him. Come unto me, all you that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord.
be always with you.
The perpetual memory of that is precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the diary in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. When he gave thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant to shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. And this is all that you shall me in remembrance of me. Wherefore, Lord, heaven and Father, according to the institution of thy only beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we vow the servants to celebrate and make you before thy and thy majesty with these thy holy gifts to be our all in the the memorial of thy Son and the Baptist today. Having your remembrance of his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering him in the most heart of thanks to the innumerable benefits procured after us. By the same. Most of you beseech your merciful Father to hear us. And if I am in this about state to bless and sanctify with thy word and your Holy Spirit, these are your creatures to spread and why. We receive the Lord in thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, holy institution, and remember to his death and passion. May we partake of his most blessed body. When we are in the city of thy Father, we live in his mercy. Accept this our sacrifice, praise, and thanksgiving. Most humbly we seek to be granted by the merits of God, thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we in all the whole church may obtain remission of our sins, and God will be in his Here we are, presented to thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice to thee. Humbly we seek to thee that we and all of us shall be our May worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. And may one body be him, that he may dwell in us and be in him. And although we are unworthy for our manifold sins to offer any kind of sacrifice, yet we beseech you to accept this our vow of duty and service, not to bring our merits to pardon our offenses, through Jesus. 
silence in this time. As we remember that you have descended into darkness. And the betrayal of the rest of our world.
Now we enter into the night of darkness. 